everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight here for our event with Martin Ford to celebrate uh, uh, his new book, Rise of the Robots, How Artificial, I'm sorry, Rule of the Robots, How Artificial Intelligence Will Change Everything. Uh, my name is Evan Karp and I am the events manager for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore in a mainstay of San Francisco's Haight Ashbury industry since 1976. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's star. Martin Ford is a futurist and the author of New York Times bestseller, Rise of the Robots, a prescient look at AI and work. He won the Financial Times Business Book of the Year Award. Uh, his TED Talk on the impact of artificial intelligence on society has been viewed over 3 million times. Uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to host Martin for Rise of the Robots and are very happy to, to host him again. Martin, uh, congratulations uh, on the book and um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. So uh, thank you, welcome. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Booksmith for, for hosting me. Um, it's great to be here again, all this, this time it's uh, virtual. Uh, I just wanted to give you kind of a brief overview of the main topics of the book and what it's about. Uh, if you're familiar with my, my previous book, you noted it mostly focused on the impact of technology, especially automation, robots, artificial intelligence on employment. It was mostly about jobs and how jobs could disappear. This book, Rule of the Robots, is a much more comprehensive look at artificial intelligence. So it's, it's really, it's not a book about robots, it's a book about AI and what it means for our society. And it also delves into the technology itself and explains it. Um, so I've tried to make it a, a pretty comprehensive resource in terms of someone that wants to become more familiar with AI and also the, the, the issues and the challenges that, that will come along with it. Um, many people perceive my, my earlier book as kind of pessimistic because it was about how, you know, a lot of jobs are, are certainly going to disappear. And that, that theme is also in this book. But um, overall, I, I hope this book will be perceived as much more optimistic. I believe that um, artificial intelligence is going to be just a tremendously consequential technology. I think it's really going to be indispensable to us because it's gonna be the tool we use to solve some of the biggest problems that we face. You know, We face a lot of big problems in the future, things like, for example, climate change. Um, and it's gonna take innovation across the board you know, to solve problems like that. And AI is gonna be really an indispensable tool in making that happen. And so I think it's, it's, it's definitely got a very strong bright side, but it's also a technology that comes coupled with some very real risks in the sense that, um, you know, there are, there are issues like automation, uh, jobs will disappear, um, and a number of other things that I'll, I'll touch on. Um, so it's, it's a technology that people really need to be aware of and they need to be familiar with. And I think that they need to be prepared to sort of enter the public debate about, about this technology and what it means for the future and how exactly we want it deployed in our country and in the world and, and um, what there needs to be in terms of government regulation and, and that type of thing. So the basic premise of the book, the basic argument of the book is that artificial intelligence is ultimately gonna be almost like electricity in the sense that it's gonna be everywhere. It's gonna impact everything. It's gonna, you know, there's nothing that won't be touched by it. I mean, if you think about your daily life, I, I mean, there's virtually nothing you do that isn't in some way impacted by electricity. I mean, it would, obviously without electricity, our life would be completely different from what it is. Um, and that's why it's such a, a crisis when we lose electric power. I think AI is, is gradually coming to be something quite similar to that, a truly systemic technology, you know, um, a general purpose technology that's going to underlie everything. And in that sense, it's, it's similar to, to uh, electricity, but there are also some really important differences. Um, electricity is very stable, right? It doesn't change over time. The electricity you get today is pretty much the same as you, you would have gotten in 1950. Um, and it's the same everywhere. It doesn't matter who provides your electricity, who your electric company is, uh, you know, the, the, the basic commodity that you're accessing is the same. Artificial intelligence is, is, is totally different from that. It's much more dynamic. It's going to change dramatically over time. In fact, it's really accelerating in its capability. So the, the AI available today is going to be nothing like what's available five or 10 years from now. You know, it's going to be dramatically ahead of where we are. And of course, it does. It does also matter, you know, where you get your AI, which which uh, which provider, which which company is making the application that you're using, and where you're where you're getting it. So it's it's a much less um, predictable, stable, 
uh, dependable resource than electricity is, but it's, it's, it's going to be much more dynamic. Um, and I think it's always going to be kind of poised to upend everything that it touches. So it's going to be just an incredibly important and also dynamic technology that's really, I think, to some extent going to um, shape our future. So one of the things that I've really tried to emphasize in the book is that it's possible for two things to be true at the same time. One is that artificial intelligence really is going to be this incredibly important technology. I mean, that's not hype. That's reality. That's really going to happen. But at the same time, there are certain aspects of the technology and certain, certain things that are focused on that really are hype, that are sens sensationalized, that are unrealistic. Um, in particular, recently, uh, Elon Musk, in, in particular, I think has been a little bit guilty of, of really just going into hype overdrive. Uh, overdrive. And there are a number of technologies that really have become super hyped. And so the reality of the field is that some of the most visible areas, the areas that have gotten the most attention in the media and so forth, may actually underperform in a sense. They may not quite meet our expectations in some ways. You know, we may not get the kind of dramatic progress that we've been kind of led to believe we're going to get. Where other areas that are less visible to get less attention that we don't pay as much attention to, that's where um, we're really going to see dramatic progress. So just to give you a couple of examples of that, um, one area that gets hyped a lot is humanoid robots, you know, robots that maybe look like people, but in general, robots that are sort of general purpose in the sense that they can do lots of different things. And, and you can think, for example, of a household robot that could do lots of chores around your house and would be really a useful thing to have, and you'd be willing to pay a lot of money for it. And that might, maybe it would look humanoid or maybe it wouldn't, but it would be a generally useful tool. And there have been predictions, of course, that this is going to arrive for many years, going all the way back to, you know, the Jetsons, the Rosie the Robot and all of that stuff. Um, and Elon Musk, again, jumped into the fray with this uh, just uh, last month. He, there was an event at Tesla in which he announced that Tesla was going to work on a humanoid robot. And he made big promises. He said, you know, that there was going to be a big impact on jobs because of this robot. He said that this would be a robot that you could say to it, uh, go to the store and get me these items. And then it would do that. It would go to the store and get these items and, and, and bring them back to you. And, you know, the reality is that's totally unrealistic. That's, he, I mean, he also said that he'd have a prototype of this robot within a year. And that's definitely, I mean, maybe you'll have a prototype, but it might be, you know, a mannequin with some wires sticking out of it or something. Um, but he's not going to have a robot that's anywhere close to being able to go to the store and, and buy things for you and come back. That's just not a, a realistic um, expectation. I mean, that you, you've seen the videos from companies like Boston Dynamics, and they've been working literally for years just on figuring out how to get robots to walk, right, and to run and to do those things. But those, those robots are not autonomous. They can't actually do things. I mean, they're, they're generally controlled directly by people. It's, they're very limited in their capabilities. Um, so the reality is in terms of um, when we're going to see a household robot that can do truly useful things, even something as simple as going to the refrigerator and getting you a, a can of beer and bringing it to you, it's probably a long way off. Um, and a robot that would be able to do that is gonna be very expensive. I mean, just imagine what it takes to open the refrigerator door. This is a heavy machine. That, that has to be quite powerful in order to do that. So it's gonna be very expensive. And before, you know, in order for people to be willing to spend that much money, it's, it's going to be, um, it's gotta be capable, right? It's gotta be, be able to do truly useful things to keep your house clean and, and so forth. And these are just, you know, in terms of the dexterity to do that, the visual perception to do that, the problem solving, these are all just challenges that are far in the future. So you're not gonna see you know, a home robot running around in your house doing all kinds of stuff anytime soon. Um, another area where there's been a lot of hype is self-driving cars. You know, and the progress has been a lot slower than what we imagined. And again, another area, another, this is another example of Elon, you know, hyping things with, with Tesla, right? And their self-driving um, capability there. You know, he's saying that in a very short time frame, Tesla owners are going to be able to download software that is going to give level five autonomy to those cars to really allow them to um, completely drive by themselves. They would be in essence uh, robo taxis. I mean, um, back in 2019, he predicted that within a year or so, he'd have a million of these robo taxis on 
on the road. And, and you know, we're not, again, close to that happening. So, you know, self-driving cars are going to come, but it's going to take a lot longer. So this is one of the issues I really kind of dive into in the book. You know, what are the areas where you're going to see things happen faster and where it's going to be slower? Um, one area where you definitely will see, I think, progress is places like an Amazon warehouse, where right now you have got lots and lots of robots, thousands of robots, and the robots are doing what robots typically can do best. You know, they're, they're doing logistics. What they're doing is they're moving things around. So what you've got in an Amazon warehouse is robots that bring a shelf of inventory to workers and workers stand in a place and they put items onto the inventory shelves, you know, the, as materials come in from the manufacturers, they will put them in the correct item on the shelf. And then when, then there are other workers who pick items from the shelf. So when someone places an order, they will, you know, the shelves will come to the worker one after the other, and the worker will grab the item and, and, you know, prepare the order to send to the, to the customer. And the reason that they have so many, I mean, they have a lot of people in the Amazon warehouses. It's been an employment bright spot, right? It's been, you know, a lot of, a lot of jobs created there. And the reason that Amazon needs so many people is that people can't, or, or the robots can't yet do that, you know, the jobs that require that kind of visual perception and dexterity, the hand-eye coordination that it takes to uh, reach in, grab an item on a shelf, all kinds of thousands and thousands of different different items, right? Different shapes and sizes and textures and grab that item success successfully and, and, and prepare the order for the customer. Um, but that is gonna change quite dramatically probably within the next decade. In fact, uh, Jeff Bezos said back in 2019 that um, within a decade, he expected to have a robotic hand that could compare with a human being in terms of its capability. So, you know, that's coming in 10 years. And of course, that one thing that means is that the, uh, the technology is gonna really begin to displace those workers. So I would expect that 10 years from now, uh, Amazon warehouses are gonna have a lot less workers in them than they do now. They're gonna be a lot more automated because the technology is gonna advance. So in general, what we're gonna see is that you're gonna see the most fastest prog progress in places like Amazon warehouses, where it's a very controlled environment, where Amazon can really control everything, can separate the robots from the people so there aren't any accidents um, and has really control of, of the workflow through the, through the warehouse and so forth. That's where you're gonna see robots really shine. Um, but out on the street where everything is completely unpredictable, even if you can build a car, you know, a self-driving car that's 99% perfect, that last 1% is going to lead to disaster, right? Especially when you multiply it over thousands and thousands, maybe millions of cars on the road. If you've got a 1% error rate, um, especially if it can obviously lead to fatal errors, then that's just disastrous. And it's getting rid of, you know, it's overcoming that last 1% um, that is really the barrier in terms of, of these technologies. So we're going to see different areas progress at different rates, but um, some of the most important applications for artificial intelligence are gonna be in, in, for example, scientific research. I mean, I think that um, AI is really gonna give a huge boost to innovation in many, many areas, because essentially what it's gonna do is it's gonna augment and amplify our own intelligence, right? Our own creativity. So if you're a research scientist or an engineer, um, this is gonna be an incredibly powerful tool. Um, to accelerate progress. And we already see that. For example, um, AI is now being used to discover new drugs, um, to do essentially search through different kinds of molecules to find the ones that, um, that can, can be deployed successfully as drugs or as other, other kinds of chemicals as, as, and as materials. Um, some of the biggest news recently came from DeepMind, right, which introduced a uh, uh, an application called AlphaFold, which was able to predict the way protein mo uh, molecules fold. And this is a huge breakthrough in science. You know, scientists have been working on this for at least 50 years to be able to predict the, the ge geometric configuration of protein molecules. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a major breakthrough that really is gonna probably revolutionize biochemistry and biomedicine to some extent. So we're already seeing a really big impact. And I think that te technology is gonna be even more consequential going forward, especially as I've said, in areas like climate change. So the book talks about that, the positive side. It talks about the science behind um, artificial intelligence. Um, it explains, uh, for example, the, the really the prevailing technology right now, which is deep learning. 
um, and, and how deep learning neural networks actually work. Um, and, and it also covers kind of the history of, of, of the science. Uh, but most importantly, I think most interestingly, it covers the future of artificial intelligence, the future of the technology and how it's going to develop. Uh, for example, deep learning or deep neural networks have seen enormous progress over roughly the last 10 years. Um, but a lot of that progress has come basically from scaling, from making these systems bigger, from using faster computers, building bigger networks, uh, giving them more and more data to make bigger and bigger systems. And uh, you know, there's some evidence that that particular approach, while it's been really, really successful, um, is really kind of petering out. You know, we're getting to the limits of that perhaps. And one of the reasons for that is that it's incredibly expensive. I mean, we already, if you want to really build one of these truly large systems um, to do a, a really major application with AI, it costs millions of dollars to, to do you know, to, to, to have access to the hardware and then to train um, these networks. Um, so, it, it, you know, as you go from millions of dollars to billions of dollars, as you keep scaling it up and up, it, it really gets, you know, beyond what's, what's possible, even for large tech companies. So probably we definitely need new innovations in, in deep learning. And I go through a lot of what's happening here and, and the approaches that um, various teams are, are taking and, and sort of the holy grail of artificial intelligence has always been to build human level intelligence, right? To build what's called AGI, artificial general intelligence. And I think that's the most, maybe the most fascinating topic in, in the field really. And I give a lot of attention to that in the book um, and the various approaches that are being taken to try to get there, how long it might take. Um, and one, one thing that I was able to draw on in this book is that I actually have a previous book I published a couple of years ago called Architects of Intelligence. And that book basically just consisted of interviews I did with some of the very top people in the field of artificial intelligence. So for example, four of the people I talked to won the, uh, the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize for computer science. And so I talked to the absolute leaders in, in deep learning, for example, people like Jeff Hinton and Yashua Bengio and Jan LeCun. These are you know, the real leaders in the field. And so Throughout this book, I've incorporated what I learned in those interviews and quoted those people and incorporated their insights about the future and what they think is gonna be important and how fast we might progress and all of that. So I've, I've kind of built that into the book. So I hope it will be a really good resource for learning, not just about how AI works today, but also about what it can become tomorrow, what we can sort of expect in the future in terms of the technology and how it might play out. Um, and I think that that's just really, um, really a fascinating topic um, in terms of the, the, the march toward building a machine that, that truly would have human level intelligence. Uh, and then this book also discusses again, the jobs issue, the fact that I still think we are on this relentless trend toward automation um, where nearly any kind of really routine job could essentially be automated. And it doesn't matter if it's a low skill job like working in a factory or a warehouse, um, or uh, a retail store or a restaurant, or if it's a high skilled job, you know, whether you're, even if you're something like a lawyer or some kinds of, some types of doctors, like a, a radiologist. And certainly if you're just kind of an office drone where you sit in an office and you do some sort of relatively routine white collar work, you know, cranking out the same report again and again, or um, doing a quantitative analysis, all of this is gonna be highly susceptible um, I think the automation probably within the next 10 years or so. Uh, obviously all of this interconnects with the pandemic, which is kind of hit in an unexpected way, but in some way the pandemic has really kind of accelerated that. And we've seen, um, for example, businesses now turning to automation in order to reduce worker density, you know, get more, more social distancing. Um, and also as a result of the, our, the pandemic and, and, you know, as we kind of hopefully get beyond it, we are now developing a worker shortage, right? Because many people perhaps have decided they're not really as enthusiastic about doing these low wage jobs. Um, there are also questions about when kids are gonna go back to school and if parents, um, you know, can, can depend on that to go back to, to work. So a lot of companies, especially in the lower wage sectors are, are experiencing labor sh shortages. And so companies are now actually being more, even more aggressive in adopting automation. You've seen fast food chains like White Castle, for example, use robots. Um, uh, 
and other restaurant chains, for example, bringing in automation. So this is actually, to some extent, I think the pandemic has accelerated all of that. So anyway, I go through that. And again, I, as I've said in the past, I'm generally a proponent of someday maybe having a universal basic income, right? I think that eventually we're going to get to the point where something like that will be required. And that's an idea that um, is definitely getting more traction in part because of uh, Andrew Yang's uh, uh, presidential campaign really brought a lot of uh, attention to that. Um, I actually did a podcast with Andrew um, a few days ago and you can, you can check that out on his Twitter feed. So we talk a lot of issues there as well. Um, so beyond that, then I also talk about the risk factors associated with AI and you know, it definitely has a dark side and there are some very significant things that we need to worry about. Um, already we see threats to security. AI could be used to hack systems to put our infrastructure at risk. We need to worry about deep fakes, which are you know, fabrications of uh, you know, fake videos, fake audio that could be used um, to deceive us in many different ways, um, to maybe to even, even to threaten democracy itself. I mean, we've seen, for example, the power that a viral video can have in terms of the social protests that we saw over the last year. So we, we, you can easily imagine that being used against us. I mean, you can imagine maybe an intelligence agency in China or Russia looking at that and saying, hey, let's create a completely fake video that is just gonna be so explosive that you know, it's gonna really rip American society apart. And I think it's easy to imagine that kind of thing happening. So these are technologies that really could be deployed in nefarious ways by bad people. Um, Another issue that's really come to the forefront is bias in artificial intelligence systems. Um, we know that facial recognition systems, for example, can be less effective at, at identifying uh, non-white people. And what that means is that the systems can be biased in the sense that you can get a what's called a false positive, an incorrect match where you know, if you're looking for a criminal or a terrorist, then a non-white person would have a higher probability of maybe being detained because they're suspected of being the suspect when in fact they're not um, because these systems are less effective. Um, so there are real issues there and, and the industry you know, is aware of those and they're working on it. Um, the other issue that I really dive into in the book at some length is the AI race with China. Um, and the fact that this is just really becoming an important issue. I mean, China is putting enormous issues into, or enormous uh, resources into artificial intelligence. The Chinese government has made it an absolute priority. They want China by 2030 to be a world leader in the technology, maybe even past the, the US. Um, China has lots of advantages because they have more data, a larger population. Um, they've got an enormous number of very talented engineers and computer scientists that are really focused on this and they are they have a lot of output you know they're, they're doing a lot of innovation um, they're certainly the world leader for example in facial recognition they've got um, lots of startups focused on that area and there really are security and military implications for this technology so it's not an area where the united states can um, afford to fall behind and the other thing of course that china is doing is they're using this technology in a very dystopian way they're using it to surveil and really control their own population, uh, really creating a kind of true Orwellian society. And this, this technology is getting exported to other countries. So China is selling it around the world, especially to more authoritarian countries in the Middle East, like the United Arab Emirates, for example, um, Saudi Arabia, places like this, but even increasingly in, in more open countries. Um, and the thing is that, of course, the success of China, and it has been successful, is really, you know, we really have to be careful that, that, that this doesn't become a model of success for the whole world. You know, the other countries look at this and see the success that China is having and decide that this is the path they want to, to face, that they want to take. Um, but even in democracies, there are real issues around surveillance and how this technology is being used. So it's really going to be critically important for even democracies like the United States and other Western democracies to, to have a, a public debate and discussion about these technologies. How do we want facial recognition to be deployed? I mean, it does bring benefits in terms of lower crime and you know, le less terrorism and things like this, um, but it really does come at the, the expense of, of privacy. So different countries, different regions, different, different states and cities 
will make different choices, you know, about how they want to de deploy this technology and how and how um, available they want to make it. Um, another area that's really terrifying is the possibility of autonomous weapons. Uh, you know, we are quickly approaching the, the point where there could be weapons that are completely fully autonomous. In other words, weapons that can find a target and then kill that target without anyone intervening. This is one of the things that many people in the AI community, you know, people that are doing research in the field are, are most upset about and most passionate about this. They really don't want their technology, their innovations to be used in this way. And there have been attempts, for example, to ban this technology in the United Nations, but so far that's not getting a lot of traction. So there's a real risk that we could begin to see, for example, the appearance of fully autonomous drones that might swarm hundreds or thousands of them and be able to attack autonomously. And this is would be a, you know, a terrifying weapon, especially if it fell into the hands of, of terrorists. So one of the things I propose in the book is we definitely need more regulation to, to take on all of these um, these basic topics, you know, these basic areas where we are facing risks whether it's bias uh, against groups of people, whether it's security risks like deep fakes, whether it is um, you know, self-driving cars, obviously, or whether it is the potential for weaponization or the use of this technology in medicine and so forth. We probably need, I think, an agency that focuses on this specifically and can actually make um, the necessary regulations. You know, Just like we have an FAA to take care of aviation and we have an SEC to deal with um, securities markets, these are agencies that have a lot of expertise in that area and they're able to make regulations in a way that you know congress can't because the members of congress don't don't have the necessary knowledge so i think we're going to need something quite similar for um artificial intelligence and then finally in terms of the the risk we face the the one that really gets a lot of focus is the existential risk right the idea that someday we might have super intelligence we might have machines that are much smarter than us, and that might really be an existential risk to humanity. They might um, wipe us out, you know, or they might do something that causes us to be wiped out. I mean, most people that worry about this are not so much focused on the Terminator that's really going to be malevolent and, and uh, attack us, but rather on a super intelligent machine that maybe we, we set on some course, we ask it to do something for us but then it acts in ways that we don't intend or there are unintended consequences and the thing gets beyond this and then we can't, we can't stop it. And that's a legitimate concern. And this in particular, you may have you know, read the book by Nick Bostrom, right? Which really focuses on this. Um, Elon Musk, once again, as usual, has talked a lot about this saying that you know, artificial intelligence is summing the demon and all of that. And I do think it's a legitimate concern and it's good that there are some relatively small think tanks with some very, very smart people working on this, but I don't think it should be our primary focus right now. There are a lot of near-term things, you know, things like weaponization of AI, things like the potential for bias or threats to security. This is gonna happen, if not now, within the next few years. Um, so it's something that we really need to give our immediate attention to, whereas this other speculation about a true, you know, existential threat from artificial intelligence is much more speculative and lies, I would say, at a minimum decades in the future. So it's great to, to have some smart people thinking about that, but I don't think it should be the main focus of our society. I don't think it should be something that the government is particularly concerned with right now. The government should be focused on the stuff that um, we really need to worry about in the, in the uh, near term, including the impact on employment and the other risks um, associated. So anyway, that's what the book plans to achieve. That's what it tr tries to achieve. I hope it does a good job of it. It gives you an overview of the technology, how it works, um, the risks associated with it, the, the rewards that will come from it, you know, the potential for it to really drive innovation and, and give us a better future. Um, and I hope it, it, it brings all of that in some, into sort of a cohesive narrative. So thank you, I'll go ahead and stop there and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Martin, so much. Uh, it's fascinating stuff and uh, a, a little bit uh, terrifying as well. Um, uh, I have a question uh, here from, um, uh, from Max, who is wondering um, if you have any idea um, or ideas about checks and balances uh, to the potential abuses of AI. 
I know um, you talked about that a little bit. Um, also, just wondering if there are organizations out that are are uh, advocating uh, of, uh, for, for us now um, that we should check out or, or, or look into to support. Right. Um, they, I mean, there are organizations like um, the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University is one by Nick Boston. And they're, they're focused on some of these issues. Mostly they focus on um, the, the issue of uh, existential threat from artificial intelligence. So something further in the future. Um, but, you know, all the main tech companies have got, you know, they, they employ people that, that are focused on ethical AI um, researchers that, that focus on this. So they're giving it attention. Definitely areas like bias in AI um, and machine learning algorithms and so forth, they're getting a lot of attention. Everyone understands we need to fix this. Um, um, and the same, I think, is true of uh, many other areas. But at the same time, we, we need government to get involved. And that's why I think that we really need an agency, you know, to, to, to work on these issues and formulate um, um, regulations and so forth. Um, and on the economic side, there definitely are um, organizations focused on basic income, for example, and, and bringing attention to that. I'm actually doing an event in Mountain View on um, September 25th, it's a Saturday, along with Andrew Yang, and we're going to sort of talk about basic income and, and, and uh, trying to get that on the radar as, as, you know, a potential solution to some of these issues. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm, I'm uh, wondering how uh, universal basic income uh, uh, works as a sort of a, um, a preemptive, uh, if not solution, then, then remedy to some of the concerns um, uh, posed by the development of AI. Well, the, the, the basic issue is that AI is going to make society much more equal, right? I mean, some people are going to do extraordinarily well and they're going to get super rich, right? But a lot of people are going to be left behind. And I, my concern, and we see that already, of course, right? I mean, even though the unemployment level is low now, or and certainly before the pandemic, it was very low. What that doesn't capture is a lot of people have just left the labor force, you know, what's called our labor force participation rate, the number of people that are working or looking for work has declined as a percentage. Um, so some people are just giving up or they're saying, you know, there's just not an opportunity out there that's worth it for me. And that's going to get worse. Um, but if we want, to not have people living on the street, which of course, especially around here, we have already. Um, and we don't want that to get worse. And we want people to ha you know, have a decent life. We've got to make sure that they have su sufficient income. And it's very clear that a lot of people are struggling. But then there's another aspect of this to this as well, which is that beyond the humanitarian concerns, the, the economy needs consumers, right? I mean, you, you, you can't have a vibrant economy if you don't have a lot of people that have the necessary income and the purchasing power to go out and buy all the products and services that are being produced. If you don't have that, you're gonna have stagnation and, and you know, you're not gonna have economic growth. Um, so I think people are coming to realize that and, and UBI or some approach, I'm, I'm kind of open-minded about it. It might be universal basic income. It might be a guaranteed minimum income. It might be a negative income tax, but some mechanism that gets more money directly into the hands of people that need it. Um, I think is probably going to be essential in the future because traditional employment is probably just not going to get the job done in terms of getting them enough income. Thank you. Um, we have another question. This is uh, from Sudhir, and I, I should just say, if you're holding on to a, a question, um, it's not too late to ask. Uh, just drop it in the chat. Um, the, the question, Martin, is um, did any issue or aspect uh, cause you to sit up in concern uh, as you wrote this book? Uh, please share your thoughts if it did. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of issues. I mean, as I said, the, probably the single most terrifying thing is that we could have weaponized AI, right? That people are gonna use this in weapons. Um, what's happened there is that there has been, you know, a lot of activists, a lot of AI researchers have appealed to the United Nations to really ban this technology um, in a way that biological weapons and chemical weapons have been banned. Um, but the three countries that have not supported that basically are the United States and Russia and China, right? Which are the ones that matter. Um, and the reason they probably don't want to ban the technology is that they're afraid that someone else will cheat, right? They're afraid that if we ban it and then the Chinese do it, then we're gonna fall behind. And it is true that, that you know, for militaries, having automated weapons will give an enormous advantage, right? Um, you know, it, it, so you understand why they might wanna pursue this. But, the real concern is if 
these weapons were to get beyond legitimate military uses and fall into the hands of terrorists or um, other kind of rogue actors, um, illegitimate, you know, people, then it could be a dramatic threat. I mean, if you're talking about hundreds, thousands of these things swarming around, attacking people, um, it's very scary. There's a, there's a YouTube video you can watch called Slaughterbots. And it was made by uh, Stuart Russell, who's a professor at um, UC Berkeley. And it kind of lays out the danger. It's a very scary, scary video to watch. It shows you what could be done with these types of weapons. So, you know, this is definitely one thing that I'm, I'm very concerned with, along with the impact on, on employment and, and the, all the other risks in terms of bias and security and so forth. Thank you. And, and thanks for the questions here. Um, uh, in, Martin, I'm wondering if there are um, ways that, um, that, that we can, uh, what's the best way to, uh, to advocate for this agency if, if, if we agree with you, which I, I think that that probably is called for. I mean, what, is this something that, that um, is kind of at the level of, of Congress yet, or, or is this something that needs it, more? It, it's it, at the level of, I mean, there's not a, a huge impact in Congress, but again, it's something that, that has to be done internationally, right? Because I mean, you know, we I, realistically, the United States can't say, okay, we're going to ban it, and then the Chinese and the Russians don't, right? So, um, and, and banning it entirely may be unrealistic at this point, you know, because because the work is being done. But I definitely think that on an international scope, we really need to take measures to make sure that this technology remains safely confined to you know the people that that need it. A little bit like nuclear weapons, right? We we don't want people running around having access to nuclear weapons. But the problem is that the entry barrier is so much lower here. You know, I mean, you look at most countries can't even develop nuclear weapons, right? It takes incredible resources to do that. Um, whereas this stuff, I mean, someone working in a basement could, could weaponize a drone, right? You know, they could buy a drone on Amazon in theory and then, and then weaponize it. Um, so the barrier to this is, is really not high. So um, yeah, I definitely, you know, if, I think if you, you Google this, if you're interested in becoming more active, just, just Google um, robotic weapons or, or fully autonomous weapons, and, and you'll, you'll come up with resources where you can um, become part of the activist community surrounded, surrounding this. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. And, and um, uh, yeah, just, I, I think we're, that, that's it on the questions. Um, is, is, there, is there anything um, that you'd like to, uh, anything more that you'd like to leave us with? No, I think that's it. I think we, we covered it. And um, anyway, I hope um, everyone will take a look at the book and I hope that you'll find it to be useful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Martin. And, and everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, get your copy of Rule of the Robots. Just uh, click through the link below. Uh, I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat here again uh, shortly. Um, take care and stay well, everybody. And, and Martin, thank you again. Congratulations. Great. Thank you very much.